This is episode 11. The times, they are a-changin'. I was driving to pick up my next guest and heading down the 405 freeway when a slowdown occurred. And I just kind of chillaxed, as I am prone to do now, after many years of friendship with this next guest, who had kind of mentored me in the art of letting it flow. And so here I am driving, and my friend would always say, we're on divine time. And so I'm driving south on the 405, and there's what seems to be a stalled car in the middle lane, so we're slowly going around it. And as I drive around this car, I notice that the driver of the car is out of the car, and he is very caringly helping a bunny rabbit not get run over <laughs> the 405 freeway. And uh, this story was so unique that I wanted to save it for um, when we actually sat down in the interview. So we were talking like the whole ride to the studio. And um, I said, I have this great story, but I, I need to hold it for the podcast. And then I forgot <laughs> to tell it on the podcast. But I knew it was the kind of story that my friend would appreciate. So here I am sharing it in the intro. This next guest is a very giving person, a very spiritual person, and has given a lot to me over the years, as well as many other independent artists. But mostly in the way of... Um, kind of changing my perspective on some things that I wasn't aware needed changing. So I hope this is an insightful interview for you. We go into independent promotion, which was our guest's forte, sort of fell into it, I think. We go into music, we go into a little bit of spirituality. So here is my interview with artist promoter Tony Koch. You take the dark side I got the inside But I take any side tonight Deep in my soul I gotta let you go But it's the hardest thing to do Ooh, baby You think of somebody else That's just Marilyn, honey Cause you never give yourself away You never give yourself away you never give yourself away, yeah. Welcome to the Language of Creativity podcast. I'm honored to have a special guest in the studio today, my friend and certainly one of my mentors, Tony Koch. Steve Levitt, I'm honored to be here, and uh, I feel like uh, you're my mentor too with music. <laughs> 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 that music you heard was an original piece by Tony that she performed on guitar and singing here at my studio before it was really much of a studio back way in 2011. May of 2011. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Mom had just passed. That's right. And you let me let out my sorrows with mm. song. Yeah. And my love. And my love. I mean, that's what it's all about, isn't it? So Tony is many things. <laughs> 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 Tony is a Renaissance woman, but when I met you, you were an artist manager in L.A. I was running a little showcase in Hollywood called Don't Call Us Tori with Shannon Hurley, and I think that's how we connected. And we're all still connected. I adore Shannon Hurley and Ben Eisen. You were managing an artist um, that had played our showcase named Jelly Moon. Mm -hmm. and uh, Australian artist came out here, yeah. Yeah, and you're originally from Phoenix, right? Totally from Phoenix, wearing my T-shirt to prove it so I know where I have to go back. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I was from Phoenix and I was referred by another artist to Jilly Moon. And my mind is getting a little bit blurred about, I apologize, I can't remember her name right now, but she's a great artist too, jazz artist out of San Francisco. If it comes to me, I'll, I'll refer it back to you. And um, I had been promoting a lot of women artists. I was known in Phoenix as... Uh, 
indie club promoter of uh, indie music in the small venues and on the off nights when Danny Zalisco and other big producers were doing shows, I would go to places like Nita Hideaway, which is now, I, I don't think anymore. I was out in LA for a while. I think it closed. And uh, I met a lot of great talent. Yeah. Now, this was back before independent was really a thing, right? This was in the 70s. Is this right? Yes. I st- well, I started in 1978 in clubs in 75, 76, 77. I was playing guitar at the time, and I was trying to get noticed as a musician myself. And I'd always get in bands, and then they'd tell me, you know, we don't, we don't like your songs. We want to rock and roll. So I, I was always left out. And I decided, you know what? I'm going to find some artists that are actually ones I could promote and bring their music to the fore and then maybe I can jam with them and have some fun and what I found out in 1977 was that there was something coming called disco and after loving maybe you've heard of it yeah (laughs) survived it I will survive um but yeah I I left my family you know there's a song that we sang I left my home and my family by Paul Simon the boxer and I really related to that 70s music and when the tide changed and the club started not to have songwriters anymore and they stopped paying us, they used to pay us in the day. You could get $25 plus tips. That was big in the 70s. I decided to become a DJ. I'd also changed my lifestyle to be more eclectic, as I like to call it, and uh, more rainbow colors and um, mm-hmm. became an activist because I felt a lot of us had been left behind because we were different. We were highly sensitive people. We felt the music. We felt the creative muse in our souls, and we acted on it. And so I started DJing at a club in 78 called The Full Moon, and it later became The New Moon. And I discovered Brad Singer, who was working at a distribution shop when we had what we call records, LPs. Mary Passarella, Mary McCann, Johnny Dixon, Scott Tuckman, a lot of people back in that era that were making a difference. Jeff Parrott's K Storm. And Tony Koch was the girl at Zia Records who at that time had left what my mom would call my real jobs to pursue music and promote artists. And wow. So. Zia Records is very formative. I've heard you mention that a lot of times, but I don't know the story. Tell me more about Zia Records. Well, briefly, I'll tell you that uh, Zia is the symbol of New Mexico, one of my favorite, favorite places to travel through. And like you had mentioned about Jilly Moon, I took her in my uh, 71 Isuzu rodeo, and we toured. I took her up north and around, and we went through New Mexico. And I thought of Zia Records, and this was kind of like a culmination of 10 years because uh, I met, well, actually 20 years because I met her in 2000. We had this, you know, the Indian symbol. Because the way I look at life is not like others in a lot of ways. I I use symbolism. And this gentleman named Brad Singer came one day into a store called Music Land. I was working for a corporate. And I was very frustrated, wanted to leave because they brought in 50 barrels or 50 barrels, 50 boxes of Barbara Streisand's new album with Robin Gibb or Barry Gibb. And I wanted you to and the wave that was coming through, and they brought me two U2 albums. Oh, my gosh. Well, that shows you their foresight. And um, <laughs> Not much has changed, yeah? No, so yeah. Brad, Brad came to me and he said, Tony, I'm starting my own company. I left this and that. I, I think the major labels are kind of killing music in a way because they're not allowing us to really play all the music, just the ones that are going to make them a lot of money. And uh, he said, I'd like to know, would you be interested in working for me? And I hear nothing but good things about you managing, so I'd like to make you my first woman manager. Wow. And that was an honor, because in those days, it was 1980, and it was not equality. We were fighting for it. Right. So I worked for him for about three years, and it was some of the best years of my life. I got to see many, many shows, and I got introduced to people that a lot of them I still know, like Mike Gormley, later in the 80s and 90s and 2000s, so... Zia Records, still around. Brad sadly passed away early in life, and um, his wonderful wife, Sandra, tried to carry on, but I believe a good corporate entity purchased it. They still have stores in Phoenix. I still support them. Zia Records, you rocked it. We gave Tower Records a hard time, and guess what? We're still going. (laughs) And I did work for Tower Records later, too. So much has changed, speaking of Tower Records. So much has changed in the music industry since 1978. 
Oh, yes. Understatement of the millennium. Well, I was the full moon originally was a country western bar. I had just gotten hired there as a second job because I wanted to do music, but I had to work during the day to please family issues and and be responsible. What a concept. And uh, And what a concept. Within a week, yeah, within a week. (laughs) A concept many are (laughs) still trying to figure out in this. Well, what I learned is if you stop seeking it, it comes. If you really are authentic with yourself and like you, you've gone through a lot of ups and downs but we look at us we're sitting where almost 10 years ago was you told me your vision and you're manifesting it yeah you got a beautiful family you got a great life you got just what you wanted because through all the struggles and everything you kept focused when you needed to take a break it took a break sometimes you didn't take a break when you did but people would tell you take a break right yeah, well, yeah that, you told me many times tony you need to chill <laughs> <laughs> So let's get back to the story you were telling. You were on the train about... Train to nowhere. No, um, Brad Singer passes on, and so I left Zia Records and uh, worked a bit for Arizona State Compensation Fund. And then later on, and I apologize because my life, I don't keep track of the years. They just kind of go forward. Um, I ran into a gentleman named Danny Zalisco, and uh, his he had a great marketing team of uh, Mary Passarella, Danielle Tobin and a whole lot of people that I'd like to mention. Terry Burke was there. Anthony Rhodes was one of the bookers for the locals, and he really taught me a lot. And Danny said, well, I need somebody to promote my show, so uh, I'm looking for a street team coordinator. So my whole life has been about adjusting to the need of changes. Yeah. We have to move on and move forward. And if something's not working, what I've learned is if it's not working and you keep doing it, then you're the one that's making the mistake. And so I took a chance, and I had left Zia Records by the time, and I really missed music. So after work, I would go and pick up flyers at, in those days, Kinko's Printing on Central, and go to about 15 to 20 stores that would allow us, stores or record places or music-oriented bookstores. In that day, Barnes & Noble wasn't big. We still had Borders. I love Borders. And, uh, yeah, they used to have live music, too. Oh, yes. I booked, yeah. Yeah, Jilly played in Borders and some yeah. of my other artists. Oh, yeah. I'm glad you did your homework. and uh, I uh, am my homework. <laughs> I'm surprised at all this random crap that comes out of my mind and I remember. But. That's okay. <laughs> um, so the 80s were wonderful. I got Indie Promoter of the Year in 86 from a small newsletter magazine called Soundboard. It was an indie. It first started getting indie around 83, 84, 85. And I learned imports and all the different kinds of sounds around the world through a friend of mine who, I'm sorry to say, has already passed, Cortina Bandolero. And Cortina used to work at Bill's Records. It was a local store that a guy named Bill owned. And all of us record store people, we were a family because we were the outcasts, right? We wore T-shirts and jeans. And my mom said, what, when are you going to wear a dress again? And I don't think I ever have. Mm. I mean, I, I think my sister's wedding was the last time I wore a dress, and that was 49 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Happy anniversary, Sherry and George. <laughs> but um, the music scene was really having a revolution. And I was at the full moon, and it was a country western, and in walks two beautiful women, Cindy Aarons and her partner, Cheryl. And uh, Cheryl was the one who wanted to purchase and have Cindy run it. Uh, they were partners. And they come up to me and they go, you know, we just bought this place and we're going to let everybody go but you because we think you might like to work here. Aww. So that's me. That's, you know, Steve, you and I talk a lot about magic and the universe yeah. bringing us together or miracles. I don't like to use magic anymore because magic is man made, but miracles are whatever. And I said, yeah, sure. And so I became a disco DJ, but I incorporated rock music and all styles at that time because I. I wanted them to be educated. I just didn't want them to shake their shake, shake, shake their booty. But most people did want to just do that. So we became a record pool a participant with Southwest Record Pool. And that's where I met guys like George and Hubert and a gentleman I just reunited with after many years, Scott Tuckman. Mm-hmm. Uh, my friend Al Collins, who's part of the Creative Muse Hour, what I do now in my spare time, was a friend of Al's. And uh, he was a DJ back then. In uh, the opposite club, Talk of the Town, and there was a couple other names I can't remember anymore. It's been so long. But my progression went from being a little singer-songwriter, writing about the heartache I'd felt or um, how war, uh, how long will it take for the world to know, 
that man is free and not a weapon of war. You know, I love lyrics. Yeah. And uh, my friend Joy Newman, I have to give her credit for that song you played in the opening Mm -hmm. that brought tears into my eyes. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because Joy Newman and I were dear friends back in the full moon and new moon days. Full moon went to be the new moon when Cindy took over. Uh, And she let me come over to her house often and, you know, with a little shots of tequila and a couple of good J's, we would uh, write songs. And I have to give her credit for that song being so good because it's a co-written. Well, you know, it's never lost on me the environment that an artist grows up in and the people around you. Because music is a scene, right? You yeah. were talking about Phoenix in those days in mm-hmm. the scene that you were a part of. Um I wanted to ask you about street teams because not everybody listening knows what a street team is. And I get the impression (laughs) that a street team was sort of a new concept at that time. Street team was revolutionary in that normally people would take ads out in the newspaper. But we found that as technology was advancing and I think uh, the Internet was starting to come through, we were losing a lot of people for lack of knowledge of where to look, where to go. So Danny was always a pioneer ahead of the game. Danny Zalisco, uh, who now runs all the talent and wonderful events out at Talking Stick Resort in Scottsdale. Danny, I'm waving at you and saying I love you and thank you for teaching me. He had a great crew. And Mary Passarell calls me up one day or comes in to Zia Records, I can't remember, and says, or maybe it was Tower Records at the time because the years went by so fast, and uh, says, hey, Tony, we need a street team coordinator, and, and we notice that you really promote the local artists, and we have concerts coming, and Danny will print up flyers, and uh, I know you got a car. I had a little truck at the time, a little Isuzu with a camper shell, and I could throw those flyers in the back of it, and I would take them to Changing Hand Bookstores, Border, Record, uh, border uh, Books and Music, and all those types of places, and... Then I would create a team of people from the Conservatory of Recording Arts and Sciences, which was new in Tempe, and a shout out to Mary Lemansky and all those, Megan Tubb, who's doing great in Austin, all those great artists from there, and um, Susie Bing, Janice Spute, the Terry Daniels family, he was an older gentleman that did security, but they really liked to help my teams. And then we'd take flyers around town, make sure the word got out, and then on the night of the show, those that did their job or that I could give tickets to because Danny was very generous. We'd come in before the shows about an hour to two hours ahead and hand out more flyers for the coming shows. Tony would walk about five to ten miles during that time one day. (laughs) And um, at large venues, small venues, America West Arena at the time, Dodge Theater now, Celebrity Theater still around. Uh, And like I said, the small clubs, Mason Jar, which was well known for being wild. And my mother would go, you're going to go to that place? And I go, yeah, I am. I said, but remember, Mom, you got to take the light in the dark. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I could tell you a lot of stories, but Danny Zalisco, Brad Singer, a lot of people that I'd love to give credit to, if I don't mention you by name, you know you're in my heart. So a street team, basically, your job was to coordinate college talent and get them to spread the word about a show. College, adult, any of my friends. I mean, uh-huh. it was diversity. I believe that we, if we stick with just one one area, you're not going to get the rest of the area. So True. I, I have a ton of friends, you know, in many different forms. And because of that, and Danny had a good good bunch of people that he knew, and he'd say, put her on the team, or put him on the team, or this guy's not working out in production, can you let him be on your street team? So I've always believed in camaraderie. Yeah. That we have to work together. Uh, ego is edging goodness out or edging God out, whatever, however you want to put it. Right. And so I've got one, but I try to tuck it in most times. And But I was proud of my street teams because I knew everybody by name, and very rarely would they not show up. And if they did, they didn't do it again. Mm-hmm. And I also went to Phoenix College kids, Scottsdale community, friends. The only ones that never really helped me with my street team was my family. But that's because they didn't understand that it was really special. Plus, I wouldn't want my sisters to go around and do that hard work. It's hard. Yeah. Well, and it's misunderstood. I think if you come from a family that has a more traditional path, it's easy (laughs) to think that, you know, maybe Tony should work at a bank or something stable with a 401k. Tony did work at a bank for 30 days, so I do have that. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) But I was looking out the window all the time. I worked at Kinko's for three months. Yeah. (laughs) It didn't last long. Um, Then I had to work for myself. 
Yeah. And you're doing quite well because well, you, you started out, when I first met you, uh, I had driven in from Phoenix because Julie lived here in L.A. She had moved from Australia. And I was helping with this thing she called Songs Alive. Shout out to Roxanne Kiley also and her husband Steve Kiley because they were head of the Australian chapter. And Miss Moon wanted to expand things. And so, like I said, uh, when we met, I helped Julie get some good gigs. She played the Celebrity Theater opening for The Simple Minds. Wow. And that was Danny Zalisco doing me because I was his street teamer that had been faithful to him. He, I only he did asked you a him, solid. Yeah, and I never asked for favors. You've known me many years, and I think that was the only time I've really ever asked him if he could let an artist have a good gig because I couldn't find her one around town because she wasn't known. Yeah, And that's part of my gift is now there's the Musical Instrument Museum, right, in Phoenix? Yeah, MIM is amazing. MIM.org. And yeah. Tony Koch was the one that they called because they couldn't sell tickets to Suzanne Vega. Huh. And they called Tony Koch. Hey, we hear you're the one that we should call, blah, blah, blah. How much do you charge? I said, not much, just... How, is, you've only given me three days uh-huh. to promote it. Well, if you do, you got to promote at least three to six weeks ahead. I think it's even more than that. Well, in those days with my team, I could right. storm the places. Oh, wow. Well, you know me. <laughs> I'm, I'm an air sign. We storm it. But um, uh, they gave me three days, and I fell shy of how many tickets they wanted to sell. They wanted like 60, but I brought in 40 more tickets than they had, and my team was already booked, so I only had a couple of girls that could help me. So I figured I did pretty good because I book ahead, right? Yeah. I mean, a little teaching moment if you're an artist or (laughs) you're doing a gallery or something like that. Promotion starts months ahead of time. You got to have three months months at least. Minimum. Six months is better. Six months, meet the promoter, talk about it, plan your stuff. Yeah, because you you have to get into people's memories. You have to become significant for them well, you also have artwork that that is a value that people will allow you to you know put out there at the time yeah yeah they we had to make them a certain size five by seven and to this day i still have people that want to send me an eight by eleven i go who am i going to hand this to your grandma <laughs> i mean i need it because i could read it but uh today the little four by sixes i love the best They're, they fit in a pocket or they fit in a purse yeah. But we don't use paper a lot anymore. No, I, I realized that with Don't Call Us Tori. I said to Shannon, you know, we really ought to not make flyers because nobody wants them anymore. Now that everybody is carrying around a phone, that's where that's where information lives. And to be honest, I've pretty much gone paperless too. If, you know, if someone asks me, do you want a receipt? The answer is usually no, because it's just going to end up on the floor of my car. Right. Same thing with a flyer. Someone hands me a flyer. I don't want this. Now it's litter. You I know, just I, tossed a receipt in one of your trash cans out here, getting ready to move in here. And I get what you're saying. Yeah. It's in the world is shifting. You know, I kind of go back to the topic earlier. So much has changed. The way music is consumed has changed. And, you know, when I got my start, uh, the record industry had pretty much fallen apart. I want to rewind and go back to a question that I had, which was, what brought you to L.A., which you kind of already started to cover? What was that experience like and what was happening in music at that time? Okay, let me roll back this marijuana memory and see what I can figure out. Okay, about 1999, Danny... uh, we formalized street teaming, and by that I mean we started to do things at the Symphony Hall, and there was a concert for Katie Lang. We had just done a concert for Tap Dogs, which was a rarity for me. I had no idea what Tap Dogs was. They were from Australia, and uh, Mary Passarella says to me, well, Tony, here, this is what we want you to do, and she gave me what I needed, and I took off and create, you know, I can create what you want once you tell me and then I can formulate it into my work and to thank me I got 20 pairs of tickets for Katie Lang because Danny said I want you to invite your friends so the first two to three rows are full of your women friends (laughs) (laughs) and I said you betcha and that's also when I met um uh how can I put it a lot of good people that would lead me on to where I am now and when Jilly reached out to me, it was around 2000, and she was coming to Phoenix with her band at the time. She had a band with a great guitarist, um, uh, Gordy Germain, who I still think of often. She had Ray Davies, not Ray Davies, uh, Tim Davies in the band. Tim Davies, I believe, was on drums. I'm trying to remember the whole band. Uh, forgive me if I don't. Uh, and in 2000, they came out 
to do a gig, and uh, we started working together. She liked the fact that I had people show up and that um, I had a passion for music. And we worked together for about five to six years, and uh, um, we got her the gig with Simple Minds at Celebrity because I worked for Danny. And But I also learned from a couple of my professional friends that for Jilly to really make it, and here's a little advice for artists. It's okay to love your music. It's okay to say, this is what I'm going to play. But if you get a professional and you're hitting your songs out for placement in TV and film or you want to get a, a real paying residency, not just a dive bar somewhere where you might get wine and stuff like that and only people that are out late at night come, you're not going to build anything with that. Where you build is when you come out of your comfort zone, when you come out of that space like Tori and Tori Amos did in the day. I helped promote her. And that's why I fell in love with you guys. Don't call us Tori. <laughs> because all of a sudden there's this mammoth of keyboard artists. Yes. Right? Jilly was keyboard. Yes. Um, and she was trying to learn guitar. Jilly was dynamic. She is awesome. Oh my gosh. She still she is. Was, whoa, was she a performer. She's a performer, entertainer. And um, Shannon is a performer and an entertainer, but in that more mystical mode to me. I love her chill music. Her and Ben with Lovers and Poets is the kind of music that after I've had a busy week, I go to Lovers and Poets. Or I'll go to, um, you know, Joni Mitchell or Alison Moyer, her later days after Yaz. And my friend Derek Horn gave me 32 CDs of top talent at like Declan O'Rourke and LP. Well, I think I'm one of the only women who doesn't really like LP. I just don't get it from her. But give me Adele, and uh, who I think is patterned after Alison Moyer, and Derek brought that to my mind last night when we had dinner. Um, those are the artists I like. The reason I like Shannon isn't because she's wild and woolly. It's because she's earthy, authentic, and sensitive. Mm -hmm. And her music, when you and her worked together, it was professional. Everybody was knew what, what their place was. Everybody had helped also to promote it. Right? Yeah. And you had a cute, cute little karma coffee house. But for me, to make money, if an artist wants to make money, you have to step out of those little comfortable places. And right. you have to be willing, as I learned from a gentleman who worked for Playtone Records, which is Tom Hanks' album, had a meeting with him briefly after a party at Jilly's house. And he said, we'd really like to put her record, B, she wrote a great song called B, We'd like to use that song, but we wanted to flip a few things, and she just doesn't want to do that. I remember that song, actually. Mm -hmm. yeah. I still do. I love it. I mean, I still have everything Jilly gave me, because even when you stop working with somebody, it was a lesson in life. When you move on, it's not because you don't like somebody or you don't love them. It's because the great spirit that I believe in or that I feel is urging me to expand. Uh, it's always about changing consciousness. If I would have stayed in in that indie mode and struggling, I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing today. And I credit her with being honest with me and honest enough to say, you know what, you're really not happy at Songs Alive. You want it to be this and I want it to be that. Right. And it's her company. Yeah, absolutely. I want to pause on something and put a light on it for a second. Uh, her song B, this is maybe a good case study. First of all, people can probably Google it. Uh, Jilly yeah, Moon, G-I-L-L-I-M-O-O-N, -L -L right. B, and they can probably go listen to it, B-E. They probably go listen to it right now. Yeah, JillyMoon.com, Warrior Girl Music. Here's what I want to, because it can be an either or thing, you know, when an artist wants to stay authentic, what were they asking her to do with that song? Like, what was the feedback and who was giving it? It was Mark, I think his name was Mark Antone. Again, um, we were having a gathering at Jilly's house, and I had already retired to my quarters because I was tired. And also, I do tarot readings, and some people had had me do a few of that, and so I, I wanted to have my privacy and be with my cat. <laughs> 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 and they were all in the jacuzzi and, and around the pool enjoying themselves. And so I hear a knock on the door, and the gentleman from Tom Hanks Playtone Records that Jilly was you know, she was pitching her stuff. I was her assistant. I was just, She was courting. She was courting this. a lot of different, yeah, yeah. pen music, a lot mm -hmm. of different ones. And uh, Playtone Records liked what they heard, but on some of the wording or the movement or 
you know, I'm not good at writing charts. I could tell you what chord you might want to change. But all he said was, I really like her style. I think she's got a great voice, but we'd like a little twitch on the hook in the chorus. Uh huh. You know, I don't know what a twitch is, but I guess you would. I don't. I don't either. Actually. Well, <laughs> well, I think he just wanted to elevate or just something that would make her rewrite an area. Okay, so he found what he considered to be the one weak point in, or a the point piece. that he wanted to elevate to yeah. a different status. Yeah, that's a producer thing to, to do. To lift it. To lift. Yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. So it's like this is really good. We want it to be great. Yeah, it's we want just, it to be this great. This is the weakest link. Right. We're holding it back. It sounds a lot like something else. Uh huh. And so we want it to sound like this part for the movie to insert it in for this scene because oh, when you, okay. like uh, an artist friend of mine, Ani Kiko, she's also from Australia. I helped a lot of Australian artists. You have a thing for Aussies. No, they have a thing for Air, uh, United States promotion. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I was blessed to be the one that was go-to. I mean, I am honored by every single person, whether or not we worked for a short time or a long time. Every single person, I still have most of their albums. And that's what I call my baggage because um, <laughs> I have i can't sell it. I can't give them away. I feel they were my heart is in each of those little... And, and not all of them... I can relate. Yeah, not all of them are properly... You know what I'm saying? Presentable yeah. to promote. Um, okay, so so you're t- you're talking about Australian artists, and there was a certain. This was at a time. It was probably like what 2005, 2002, 2003, 2003 through the 2000. seven. This was a time when that sound was really on the verge. I mean, yeah. Star 98.7 in LA was the station and Jack Johnson was about to break, and like things were really poppy and kind of happy and kind of. A little well, Midnight cor- Oil and those boys, Men at Work, they had made a name for the Aussie artists. I didn't uh-huh. know what Oz was. I was uh-huh. from Arizona. But it was at a time, I think, when it, it would have been possible to break an artist like Jilly, and that was probably one of her strongest songs. There were several. So here was a record label that was owned by a celebrity actor, right? Tom Hanks, you mm-hmm. said? Mm-hmm. And they were wanting this song to place in a film. And they to wanted, my knowledge. And they wanted to change one part of it for the film is that right that's my understanding when i talked to him that night and also they liked a few of her other songs she wrote a song called woman also very good song very good song yeah a woman's anthem you know she she writes about the times very very astute writer so okay and so basically uh, the response from the artist was absolutely not not changing my art not in a way yeah yeah like like uh, this is mine and i'll just keep looking for some and i don't think at the time i can understand again it's yours yeah but but in buddhism as we say you gotta have one hand open to receive right and then the other one you close it in and then you learn to open that one up and let it go yeah <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's interesting because, as you said, the record industry is not always right Mm -mm. in the case of, you know, all of uh, cases and boxes and cases of Barbara Streisand Records and only two U2. U2 And who are the other guys at the time that were really happening? I mean, we had disco. uh, I just felt that they weren't listening. Corporate doesn't want to listen to the little guy that's the one that's working their ass off for him. Excuse my language. Yeah, no, that language, this is the language of creativity podcasts. <laughs> we do use language on occasion. Fair warning for everybody. Well, I've got nieces and um, nephews. I just don't Oh, okay. We'll, we'll, we'll bleep it out then. We'll make it like a aruga sound or something. Yeah, <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, and it's interesting because it is a difficult road to navigate when making some of those decisions because obviously you want someone to take you somewhere and they're telling you you need to change this have it what's an example of you've worked with a lot of female artists what's an example of sometimes where somebody has come in and say you need to dress a certain way to sell more tickets like maybe in a kind of an uncool way (laughs) well i'll tell you what they can tell me to dress till the day is long and i'm going to be who i am yeah and i tell my artists what are you comfortable with? If you're not authentic, people are going to feel it. You know who's one of my favorite artists I met through Songs Alive? And I never promoted her um, except because I liked her, was Heather Lomax, hmm. a.k.a. Michael Ann. Remember Michael Ann Azuli? 
And she's a uh, Americana artist, and she plays a lot of gigs opening for some of the big big guys at Canyon Club. She was a member of Songs Alive. Um, that era from 2000, 2000 to 2007, when I was with that group, that scene, I also was attending a lot of DIY conferences. I mean, Jilly was an activist. I was an activist. Yeah. Well, I worked for Clear Channel technically at the time. Danny Zalisco's company was bought by Clear Channel Radio, who I believe killed radio. You know, yeah. they, they say video killed the radio star. No, corporate killed yeah, the radio. Yeah, uh, for 30, 30 long playlists of automated DJs killed radio. Yes, and yeah. yes, because I was one that used to go to the radio stations, and I worked at radio for a while. I was a receptionist at Copa, and we had, uh, what was it, uh, KZZP was our... Um, Rival, they were more uh, disco, dance, and pop, and we were more soul and R and B. So I've been through the changes, and the the thing that I try to tell these artists and a lot of these songwriter groups here in L.A. You asked me how I ended up in L.A. I turned forty eight years old, and I just kept helping artists coming passing through on their tours in Phoenix, and I thought, why can't I do this in L.A. and maybe we can make a revolution happen. And um, I was at a conference, and Jilly wrote an article called Clear Channel is the Music Mafia. Well, that kind of ended my career at Clear Channel, because isn't that your artist? <laughs> no <laughs> you know? shit. Right? Oh, my and gosh. I, and I, but I admire her for the courage. And, well, I and it also needed that. to be said. Yes, and it also changed my life. Yeah. Because then I de- devoted my next five years to her causes, to her warrior so girl music. So you were guilty by association. They... I usually am. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, and that is that is a thing or was a thing in the industry, um, you know, blacklists are a thing. And, you know, who you know is it becomes a club. It becomes a a it it has always been a boys club. And then some of us girls were infiltrating. But the good news is I met enough good people here in L.A. like John and Joanne Brahini. Even Michael Laskow, who who does the Taxi Road Rally, I might not agree with it and how it runs because it is, in my opinion, still favoring those who already have. I decided to start Pitch a Song. Pitch a Song was around the time that Jilly and I split up because I saw things down the road coming, just like her not changing the music for that one one thing. And there was others, but I admire her for sticking to her guns because she's still doing her thing and she's got a great career and God bless her. But for me, I help artists by telling them the truth. You and I have had many conversations that I may not like what you're telling me, but I sure go home and listen and I meditate on it. And I know you and I have had a very dear friendship for nearly 20 years now. 2003 oh no not quite 15 16 yeah i wasn't good at math but um i really treasured each of these artists that i met through songs alive and the song net with jimmy yamagishi what i don't like about these smaller organizations here in la is they tend to promote open mics and open mics in my opinion help kill artists getting paid because what club would rather not have to book and pay a booker, and then pay a band, and then worry about liquor sales. Because, right, clubs are about selling liquor. And um, these open mics, to me, except for a few, there are a few that are good, um, they seem to allow artists that aren't of quality to take over, and then people leave before the real band or the real artist wants to get up there. So... You know, I want to ask you this. Isn't that kind of why you started Don't Call Us Tory? Well, I was going to say, open mics are amazing when you're starting out and you need uh, to get your chops up and you need to get over your stage fright and things. But there is a huge problem in Los Angeles in particular. It kind of started the whole pay-to-play thing. Exactly. And the problem was is that it was lazy booking. I think it has a lot to do with geography, but it's it's basically like clubs saying 
oh, I have a guarantee because I can just charge these artists who want to play so badly that they'll they'll put up $300 to play my club. And we'll just say, oh, well, you know, if you don't bring 20 people, then you owe us $300. That's pay to play. And that was invented here, as far as I understand it. And that was kind of the situation when I got into the scene here. Music had changed a lot because the major labels had fallen on their faces. Napster really changed about the time you moved out here right and that's why all these indie music conferences diy conferences started becoming a thing it was people who were in any way connected to the industry who were still trying to figure out what does this new future look like on the one hand an artist like jilly moon could self-release and actually do pretty well and you don't need a label anymore but on the other hand there was no more path to stardom so people were paying to get a stage because how else are you going to get how else are you going to get to play and then you know <laughs> you got me started on a tangent but that's okay um it's your show <laughs> you yeah it's a, and i tangent all the time um one of the things that i noticed was in la there was this very um diminishing return vicious cycle of artists who lived here would invite 30 or 40 of their closest friends in air quotes because they had to meet these ticket quotas and so i had the show you got to come out please you know and their version of promoting was promoting to their friends and family and eventually what would happen is is you know three four five six seven eight more gigs you do the more that would implode because you know friends and family can only support for so long before i mean la is spread out you got to drive you know down to santa monica if you live in the valley that's that's 45 minutes and then you got to park and you got to have two drink minimum and then you're buzzed and you might get a dui and you have to pay at the door they want you to have 15 20 dollars of cash and you're going to have twenty dollars to park and by the time you get out of there i mean and a lot of times the other bands were pretty terrible you know you'd go to see your friend and you'd wait and wait and wait and they'd be late you know like they'd run late sometimes, they were unprofessional. sometimes i mean it was not uncommon in my early days to see a start time of like 11 p.m yeah for for a band that i had friends that was supposed to be on at nine that was yeah and <laughs> well no if it's 11 p.m start time that means they're not starting to 1 a.m oh okay yeah and then it's like last call and you got to go home and you know it just it was a really poor environment for music and la has that problem and so i think what you're talking about is quality in a a show because you're a promoter you come from that and you you come from putting on a good show it's one thing to be an artist but it's another thing to know your craft and to really be able to entertain so when we f- kind of came up with the idea for don't call us tori it was like let's put together artists who are in the same style you know they all play guitar piano and they're all female and they're all in this genre that we didn't know what to call at the time it was triple a adult contemporary yeah and that's a terrible name for that format i mean there's sarah mclaughlin tori amos jewel fiona apple all these great artists and basically if you played a piano your review and music connection would say oh she's like tori amos because she plays piano and it was like maybe that artist sounds nothing like tori amos i mean tori amos is very unique but we didn't know what to call it so that's why we came up with the name don't call us tori and i loved it i i, I loved it i was gonna i was actually gonna ask you because i never have what you, what was your experience with promoting street team stuff for tori amos I and mean, what was that like it was awesome because uh everybody said tori who and uh, this was right after she'd f- finally broken the East Coast area where she was at. And we, Danny, in his brilliance, booked her at the Valley Art Theater. And that was on Mill. Zia Records was down the street on Mill. And Tower Records was down the street on University and Mill. And Roads to Moscow, which was more of an eclectic British pop, uh, dark, uh, I would call it, you know, metal music kind of okay. vibe. We were different. We were everything. And um, uh, we all chipped in together to promote this artist coming through that we believed in because she had a different vibe and she was courage in her lyrics. She was telling about some of the hard things that she went through. And so um, Valley Arts sold out. It was only 300 seats, but we considered it a victory because nobody at that time, it was all about the boy bands that were heavy metal or, you know, Deep Purple Time, Pink Floyd, all that stuff. And, right. or, and the ones that wanted to sound like that. Now, we had a great band in the 80s in, in Phoenix, or maybe it was the 90s, like I said, things blur. 
a Dead Hot Workshop. They finally got an award from the uh, uh, Arizona Music Hall of Fame, of which I'm on the advisory board, because those of us who did street team, it wasn't easy because nine out of ten times I'd, I'd go to a party or I'd go someplace and I'd say, hey, have you heard of Tori Amos? No, who's Tori Amos? I said, well, here, take a look. Here's her website. Here's her link. Uh, you can get. And then sometimes the record label, because I did a lot for Bob Conrad. I have to throw a, a shout out to Bob Conrad, old Columbia record A and R man, who gave me a lot of records. He, that was my, that was my, uh, how can you call it, my paycheck, was I'd get boxes of records to take to the record pools and pass around, and then what I couldn't use or what didn't matter, Brad would buy through Zia Records, and I'd make some cash. And uh, Tori was one of those that we didn't get a lot of freebies from her because she was a, technically started from indie and then into a label. But by the time she was famous, I wasn't seeing her shows anymore. I think I saw f- the first five years. But today, I'd still want to go see her because she was willing to not sell out, to continue to follow what she felt was best, and... I couldn't tell you what she's doing today, but those early days, they were exciting. And then when we, the street teams, kind of disbanded as as the online came on. And so uh, I had to get with my computer, which is part of why I have bad eyes now, because I spent 12 to 15 hours a day checking things out. I used to work for TRL. I worked for a market development company, a great company of a uh, promoters out of New York for, for about five, six years. And my job in between breaks, my boss would say, where are you going again? I said, oh, I, I don't know. My stomach doesn't feel too good. I go to the restroom and I make a few votes and then I go back to my desk. <laughs> and um, God bless my bosses. They were so good to me. They knew that I was an artist. And finally, one day I realized, you know what, Tony, it's not about the money. And I met a lady. I was referred by my friend Lee Tayo to a lady named Marsha Reynolds. And this was 1996, as I was still doing music and trying to make a living through record companies that are only paying three fifty to five fifty an hour. And even as a manager, I think if I made eight bucks an hour, I was wealthy. Wow! And the boys got ten or twelve fifty, but we'll go into that on another subject. Um, anyway, so um, Marsha Reynolds comes into my life. My friend Lee Tile was a videographer and was doing some videos for her, and said, uh, "Well, you got to meet Tony." She's an odd duck, but if you can, you know, let her be her spacey self, she'll do everything for you and she'll help you. And Marsha had her first book coming out, independent, self-published. This is also, not just music was revolutionizing, everything was. And uh, she was a young author. She had worked at many major companies uh, as a training coach, I believe, or training educator. Forgive me, Marsha, if I get this wrong. And... um, she hired me to do local promo and get her into like borders and get consignment. In those days, we could consign people. And that's how you broke in to get the biggies to know you. That means to get a space on a shelf in a major store, you basically... Paid let for your, shelfage. You, yeah. You let your product go in there and you don't get paid unless it sells. So, right. Jilly yeah. Moon. I got Jilly Moon and Tower Records. I mean, see, that's why people liked me because... I would get them in places they personally couldn't because, oh, it's another artist. But Tony Koch had a good reputation for being honest. And while a lot of my friends, like Derek Horn once in a while, like last night, he said, oh, yeah, you always have me listen to your artists, and not all of them are good. Well, that's okay. I I feel the soul of it. I don't necessarily, I'm not looking for a million-dollar seller. I'm looking for somebody like Steve Bannon who really has his heart and soul into his music, or someone like Mike Dwyer, and some of these kids that come out to Carl's Cozy Corner Cafe now that we do Creative Muse Hour House concerts once in a while. But I digress. Well, you know, actually, that's an important point, because one of the things that I've noticed about you and other artist manager promoters in my life, who like Nicholas Washburn, yeah. um, is that there's something in you that has a heart for artists and a heart for music. And that, what that means is, is that you're willing to believe in someone before they're good, before anyone else will know that their music is good. You sense the, you sense the potentiality or you know where their heart is, where they're going creatively. And so to you, you hear it, you hear it like it's at that level after someone's worked with the producer and developed themselves. And so you're, I've noticed that about you. You just promote, you know, just with so much heart, people who will become 
listenable and good but the thing is is that when i hear those artists and i hear the gamut from beginner to really well polished it's like as a producer i can hear the diamond and the rock because that's my job and so i can tell you tony what this person needs is xyz and you're like oh thank you okay and then you know what to tell them or you already have told them and they you know i just got a second second opinion opinion. (laughs) exactly but you know oftentimes it takes an artist three to four years to really incorporate good feedback because it's a personal growth journey. That's what art is. Well, you have to absorb. I was listening to the the lady who wrote Eat, Pray, Love has a podcast about creativity called... uh, magic lessons and they were saying that as well that the yes you want to touch other people with your art but number one first it's a personal journey of self-expression and growth and so that's why sometimes i think it does take some of us three or four or five or ten years i'm starting to i'm starting to realize that some of the things i'm doing in my career now which you've helped me out so much over the years are a seed that you planted in me 10 years ago and it (laughs) took me five or 10 years to figure out it was like good advice but i couldn't figure out how to do it like how do i make this i love the idea but i can't i can't figure out how to make this work with my current reality and then i had to kind of go off on my own for a little while and let it percolate and then go oh boing bing but it's it's the growth factor and everybody everybody has that With so many choices at your fingertips these days, it can seem overwhelming. So I create sound developed the Artist Advisement Session, so you can talk to an expert just like me who can help you navigate your creative and technical landscape. Arizona Songwriters members get a special discount for the first five people to mention this podcast. There's nothing that I wouldn't do Just to be with you there's nothing that I haven't said To reach deep inside your head All the other fancy lovers Will take their money and their toys What I'm gonna give you Baby, let me give this to you This is million dollar noise This isn't live or anything, so the cool part is, is I usually cut out anything that's, you know, like, oh, adjust your mic, blah, blah, blah. You know, that's, it's really... I figured you did, but you can also insert my humanity. It's okay. <laughs> oh, the huge manatee. <laughs> <laughs> the huge acidity of myself. <laughs> you know, I'll be 66 the end of uh, September. I don't feel it, but I look at it as a double six. And uh, that makes a 12. And 12 means you sacrifice a lot to get to where you want to go because it adds up to a 3. And 3 is fertility. Mm. The double 6, 6 represents coming together, communication, partnerships. We've always been good partners. You call me a mentor, but, you know, it works both ways. I appreciate that honor, and I am your elder. However, it is from the youth that we continue to move forward. Well, I'm honored that you're here. Namaste. I'm glad that you came all the way from Phoenix to uh, visit us there in La La Land. Well, may I tell you why I came? Yeah. First of all, I've been gone for 11 months, and I was missing my friend something crazy. I love Carl Percival. Carl is a gentleman that owned the Stone Bar for many years, and I met him, like you say, 
no coincidence, but when I was doing some gigs at 55 Degree Winery, you know, I continued my promotion throughout after leaving Songs Alive. Then I joined up with some wonderful people. But I really missed my friends and the songwriters gathering that we had started to create through Creative Muse Hour. And um, I had a few days off, and my friend Al Collins was going to turn 50. And I have a few other friends having birthdays in August. So Carl said, let's throw a party for Al. And so I decided to get a few, little few days off and a break from Phoenix and flew out. Been really busy. So honored by friends calling and reaching out and coming to the party on Saturday. We could talk about that later if you want. And part of the par reason we had the party was to help another artist named Steve, Steve Bannon, the one you like. And um, he made a new album. And uh, I, I think he's another authentic artist, and I will send you his links. Not Steve Bannon, the Politico, but Steve Bannon, the, the original like. Stevie, yes. <laughs> the original the Steve Bannon. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna start here, mm -hmm. and it's just you and me. Forget the, forget the audience for a little while. We're just gonna have some fun, like we were in the car. Um, so you're retired now. Retired, and I've got new wheels, so I'm still going. <laughs> um, I retired two years ago I was 64 and I decided uh, that it was time to really enjoy life and not be worried about everybody else's enjoying life and my sisters wanted me to come home and I just felt it was time and I'm still doing things but now I've been blessed enough to choose now, you moved back to Phoenix as a part of that, right? My hometown is Phoenix. I'm born and raised there in 1953. I'm a Libra, September 28th. And, uh, yeah, my soul was calling me back. Yeah, it felt very... It felt like time. Well, I also, you know, you and I meditate a lot, and I was feeling there was going to be a big one. And I didn't come out too wrong because 10 months later, you guys had that one up there by... Uh, what is it? By Ridgecrest. Right, right. Yeah. And um, I felt a week or two before, a couple of friends had called that their animals were restless. And if CBD would be good for them or whatever, I'll just get them one of these sh shirts. And my heart immediately said, you're going to have an earthquake. Those animals are warning you. Hmm. Because you know how spirit is. Mm -hmm. I remember there was a time when I was dealing with a pain flare-up. And I was on my bed in agony, just didn't know if I was going to drive myself to the hospital, didn't know what I was going to do. And sure enough, you called me and said, Steve, are you okay? <laughs> yeah. And I'll never forget that. Yeah. Because, you you know, I mean, I believe in the collective consciousness, so mm -hmm. we're all connected to each other. But you and I definitely share a, a spirit connection and have experienced great spirit, as you like to call. Um, and... I just, I think that has been one of the most mind expanding things for me was to learn from, from you about the, the sensitive nature that I have, like being, I remember when I met you, I was in a really bad place. I was trying really hard to be the chief engineer at a new studio and it wasn't working. Uh, it was failing and I was in a new marriage and I had a lot of pressure on myself to just make it in this career as an audio engineer at the time. I was 28. And uh, Don't Call Us Tori had ended. Um, and somehow we we reconnected. I remember we were at Tangier. Yeah. And I forget if it was Amy Clark who was playing Probably. or someone. But I just, I remember knowing you vaguely from Don't Call Us Tori. And you introduced yourself and you had explained to me like the changes in your life and i well, said you were going through uh your uh saturn return right 27 28 29 right right um but i just remember you were going through something and you were really frustrated about it and i said well that's okay i'm a peacemaker <laughs> <laughs> and you are <laughs> and i think i think that was the start of our, our friendship yeah. our official friendship i and needed a friend and you gave it to me yeah and i really needed some direction because i was putting so much pressure on myself. I mean, I was trying to move out of the film world and into my chosen career path, which was music producing. And, you know, I'd kind of done some of that and made some headway, but was kind of hitting a lot of headwind. And um, I remember 
It was like, it was the fact that you said, well, Steve, you're not like everybody else. Stop trying to be like everybody else. The way that they do it is not the way that you do it. And you are who you are because that's what you're here to do. And I just had never, I don't think I had ever understood being from a very competitive family and from a world of, you know, people who are very successful, never understood that softer side to life or the intuition that comes along with being a sensitive person. And you really shared that with me and you nurtured me the way you nurture many of your other artists. Thank you. And uh, I really, I really feel that you helped or had a part in saving my life. Well, I want to thank you for that because uh, my spirit, the the words I heard inside my head was, this gentleman is being told he's too sensitive. He's being told he's got to do this. He's got to do that. And I, you know me, I will say what I'm feeling or hearing. And um, I think you kind of saved my life too because I was lost at that point. I didn't know what direction. I had left Songs Alive, and here I thought I was going to have a career helping singer songwriters through a great organization. But she wanted to move it online, and I want it personal. I like to, just like with you and me, mm-hmm. we are personal with each other. Mm. And, uh, you know, where that day that I called you, I, I just felt an urge. Something was telling me your your surrogate son, Steve, <laughs> is uh, is going through something. Can you, can you just give him a call and ground him? And you and I do that for each other. We both have this innate ability to see far down the road, and not everybody sees it with us. True. So we have to learn to hold back or... And this is where I admire you. You were going through a hard time at work. You had just had a new marriage. You were trying to uh, make a solid living. And when you're in music at this town, it's hard to make it solid unless you really hit even few, if yeah. you really hit yeah, the even big if you time. Win. It's yeah. I know some people that have made it and still struggle. But I told you today when I met you, you are much more calm, at peace, confident, and it's comfortable. And and both of us have nothing but good stories to share. Well, you know, I mean, it's a testament to <laughs> letting go, I suppose. And that's kind of something you were alluding to while we were outside is <laughs> that part of, I mean, you always used to say to me, you take the tea out of trust, you get rust. Mm-hmm. And I don't think I have ever understood trust and faith the way I understand it now. And there's something that you taught me about timing, which is that you'll know when something's aligned, you'll know when it's the time and when it's not. And you can almost, for me, I can feel it when it's not or when it is. And I've used that and I've cultivated that in my career now. Like today, we were supposed to get together on Friday and you had just traveled. I thought you were traveling Tuesday. You traveled Thursday and traveled all day and you were tired. And there was just sort of like too much in the air and uh, Mercury was going forward and it was chaotic and it wasn't the right day. It wasn't the right day. And so I finally just said, and I think this is what I've learned um, through my practice of becoming aware of myself as a highly sensitive person, that it's okay to say, you know what? I'm not up to it today. Mm-hmm. And it's okay to be authentic I and honest. I really want to do this. And when we do this, it's going to be beautiful. And perfect. And everything is perfect. Everything is perfect. Even the tired Steve that needs a nap and can't do the podcast on Friday is perfect. And that meant that we got to do today. And it's look at what a beautiful day it is. It turned out to be a beautiful day. Tony was tired on Friday because I, you know, even though I'm retired, I still consult. And uh, I tell people if you need a, if you have a question and uh, you need some help, you can always contact me. Um, but... I just felt that we had that party coming up and I needed to help Carl set up and we both respected each other's position. It's about respect. When it takes practice because Mm -hmm. you and I didn't always have the communication skills to, I mean, I know as a giver, when somebody asks me, can you be here? Can you do this? The answer is already yes before I've thought about it. I raise my hand. (laughs) And I think as sensitive artists, as empaths, as people who are more emotionally based, that it's really important to learn how to honor yourself. And I get that sometimes we can be seen as a little temperamental. 
bossy. I keep hearing, you're so bossy. And it's like, well, <laughs> don't take it that way. I just... But that, like you, you said, move. <laughs> like you said, I mean, that was one of the gifts that you gave me is that, you know, I was always told is especially as a male, you're too sensitive. Yeah. You know, just just toughen up, just get over it. And I had that playing in my head and it was fitting me into this life that wasn't mine. It was fitting me into this mental pressure cooker that just wasn't healthy for me. And I know now that as an artistic person who's getting to know other artistic people, that the magic and the love comes from that deep place Mm -hmm. that has to be protected it's like Mm -hmm. a wellspring you wouldn't want poison to go into the well and you can't you can't expect anyone else to understand it although in rare times when spirit brings you a friend like you that does understand and they can wrap their wing around you and sort of be an angel to you in that time you know, it can be really hard being a sensitive soul or an it artistic is hard. soul, especially in this world. Well, uh, this world is an earth-driven mechanism of monetary greed. You know, there's a reason why they say the root of all evil is the love of money. Right. And greed is what's killing the music scene. Greed is what is... uh pushing a lot of us away from doing certain work because I don't want to work with those kind of people. And I decided to just be humble and do the best I could with what I have as gifts to offer. And that made me an indie promoter, um, artist development and mentoring, which I call Adam for short. I'm the new Adam and, you know, you might be the new Eve. We don't know. (laughs) But it's about changing changing, um, your concepts. There's a great movie out. And you can watch it for free on YouTube still, I believe. And it's called The Shift. And it's with Wayne Dyer, who was one of the mentors. I had started talking about Marsha Reynolds. And Marsha was really into Louise Hay, Wayne Dyer, and taught me a lot about other things. As I worked in her office and the phones weren't ringing or I could take a break, I started reading a lot of her wonderful books. And so as you give me a credit for mentoring, I give her credit. And she's now on her sixth book, I think, and it's a coach's book for coaches, and it's called Reflective Inquiry. Now, think about that, Reflective Inquiry. And so when a coach is talking with a person and you're mentoring them or coaching them, there is a difference. And again, Marcia, please forgive me for I am not a specialist like you. It was perfect in this moment. Right. You're perfectly communicating to those who are listening. (laughs) Good, because I want them to know that whatever anybody else has told you to be, get over it and be who you are. (laughs) Because if you're not authentic, people will catch it. Most of the artists that come to me, that's so true. A lot of times they try to be something else. And that was why. Guys come to me and they go, well, they could just twitch this. And maybe maybe that artist was right for not twitching it because it was really who she was. Yeah. So you you and your spiritual moments, we both have been at lows, right? And you have oh, yeah. listened to me for hours at the Corner Deli <laughs> and uh, other places. Like today, I wanted to go by there just to reflect on how far we've come. Oh, my goodness. That that was, yeah, that was wonderful. And get a good bagel. And get a, <laughs> Yes, and get a good bagel. I do love my bagels. I think you just said it wonderfully. Now would be a good time to ask you for plugs and promos, but I would also want to say a couple other things. Well, I could, I could go a couple different directions. Um, we could make a circle. <laughs> we could. I often like to do that. There's a couple things I didn't get to ask about, but that I think it's okay that we don't. Well, you can ask about because I don't have much to plug, and I'm not doing real promo. I can just do a quick wrap up at the end. Uh, okay. Because I like talking spirit with you. I mean, uh, we both have had. Oh my gosh! A lot I'm of just growth. gonna I'm just gonna spitball some of the topics that are coming to mind. Okay. John Brahini and Joanne Brahini. Thank you for mentioning them. I got a special phone call last night from Joanne, hmm. and uh, I was gonna try and have lunch with her. And like you said, the days have just flown by. And just as I was about to call her, divine timing, ring, the name pops up, Joanne Brahini. 
She leaves me a voicemail. I bring my stuff in and I call her back as soon as I can. We had a half hour phone conversation in which Joanne, who's my mentor, one of the people I truly admire, and John, who wrote The Craft and Business of Songwriting, they spent their lives elevating others. And they and just to say they they run a songwriting workshop where some very famous they songwriters did years ago of, yeah have come through what what were some of the names it was called Pitchathon and then they had uh, songwriters I wasn't here at that time so I'm really kind of blanking on the name but uh, I can't I can't tell you didn't some... Carol Bear Sager or Diane Warren come through there possibly yes yeah yeah I mean like legit well this is the eighties with uh, Le- Len Chandler John Brahini. And um, a few others, but it's mainly John and Lynn. And Joanne was married with John, and she was the wonderful. She was a former publisher. She still may be. I, I only, you know, I don't look at her like, what do you do? I listen to her. When I have had the last five years since John has passed, God rest his soul, John helped Linda Ronstadt. He wrote a song uh, that she recorded called December Song, I believe. And again, I apologize for not having the best memory on some of this, but they had a songwriter's showcase that was really also about teaching. And this is one of the things, when I mentioned about open mics, I wouldn't mind an open mic. This is what Carl and I do now. We let the songwriters gather. We let them play outside. And uh, like I said, this this time we featured Steve Bannon uh, and some songs from his new album. And then along with Colonel Daryl on drums, Jimmy Yamagishi on bass, and uh, Glenn Colkin on lead guitar, uh, they made a great band that was rocking us with the Stones and some of the old, old-time old music. That Shout was... out to Jimmy, who's also done a lot for the local songwriter That's community. Right. I mentioned him earlier with yeah. the Songnet, yes. Uh-huh. And Jimmy's, you know, he's written thousands of songs, and I would, I wish that he would really let someone else take his songs and, you know, tweak them. But you don't want to say that to somebody because it's their song. And um, the reason I love Colonel Daryl, I've heard him, I was going to mention one of the artists that he was helping, a gentleman named Dwayne. I have the album in my bag, but I don't want to open it up now. And he played that album for me, five tracks, and he... Mixed it, mastered it, did all of it, replicated it. You know, he's in-house, majorlabelmusic.com. And he does our podcast, Creative Muse Hour. And I met him through Judy Lampoo. And most of us are very different in how we look at the world. But the one thing we all love is that music is a language. And just like this is the language of creativity, a great name for it, because there's nothing more that we could ever possess than a gift of being creative and everyone has it you just need to tap into it and when you tap into it it's phenomenal because just like you opening up with that song of mine that I wrote when I was like 23 years old 24 and I just broken up with somebody I really loved and really cared about and as it happened uh, months later after we broke up she fell and hit her head and passed away So she'd never heard that song. And that's why when you opened up, I was crying. Yeah. (laughs) But when you write from your heart, and I never promoted myself because I felt everybody else was so much more talented. And that's one thing I want to say to these artists and friends who are listening to this. You are talented too. And if people tell you that you can't do it, you tell them, well, maybe you can't, but I'm going to because I have a vision. And my vision can also be co-visioned with others. And again, I relate back to Marsha Reynolds, who taught me about co-visioning. And you and I, we co-vision, right? We used to meditate together or talk or I'd read your cards or I'd flip a card. I don't do that much anymore because I've learned to just sit in silence and listen to it. And it tells me, you know, you better call Steve today because I think he's got an issue. And so I call you, right? And uh, how many times have you called me and I'll say, oh, I was just thinking about you? All the time. Yeah. And it's becoming a thing. Some of my friends are like, oh, that's so weird. I'm like, I just smile. <laughs> and I think that it, it becomes you to become this person or to uh, reinforce who you are because each of us are given uh, a certain time on this planet. And again, Look at what we call history before uh, there's B.C. and and, uh, A.D. Well, there really is no time. We just keep continuing. And when I leave this planet, this podcast, I'm going to be probably 
really proud of so that if somebody finds it underneath uh, what's demolished after many centuries, it might enlighten that kid to say, wow, those aliens were pretty cool. They, they did it. <laughs> <laughs> and and for, for the artist, even if you don't think you write a good lyric, write it. Make a notebook. Get a notebook out there. And, and then what I'm going to say to you is I've got friends that, and, and Steve's one of them, Ask for an hour session to mentor. Ask for two hours. Pay the guy 50 to to $100 if you've got it. If you don't, tell him, hey, can I do something for you? There's always the barter system. And here in L.A. where it's pay to play, I say no. I say have a house concert. And right. uh, I want to throw some shout outs you said about plugging. I'm not plugging. I'm just appreciating. Uh, like Julie Zipperer, uh, Julie and John Zipperer, who do Julie's Join on House Concert. Russell Paris and his lovely wife. Uh, so many people that are doing things. Concertsinthehome.com. My buddy Merle Berganti, who in 87 taught me, Tony, there are some nice male producers. They won't all be trashing you and making you do things you don't want to do. And he helped open my mind because I was very closeted and very closed in. And after Debbie died, I went inside my shell. You know, Deb Silva was this wonderful young person who I was a DJ at the time. You were talking about that era. And the very first song she gave me as a gift was Patti Smith. Mm. Well, one of my best friends, Joanne Nathie Strobel, one of the first albums she gave me when I finally came out and became who I was, was Patti Smith Horses. Mm -hmm. So I knew that, hey, Tony, maybe this is who you are. Maybe it's okay to listen to uh, Patti Smith and listen to those rockers and Elton John and Queen and the ones that are not quite in the mainstream. Because if you're in the mainstream, you're in the middle of the muck. <laughs> if you're on the edges, you can still be pretty independent. And then you can make the choice if you want to cross that river, if you want to float across it, or if you want to find a bridge. I tend to go for the bridge. <laughs> well, it's an honor to have you today. Thank you for sharing your soul with us, your music, your generosity, and your stories. Um, Can I give them my link? Yes, please do. Uh, I would like you, if you liked what you hear today, I am living in Phoenix, Arizona, but I still help artists. If you want to come to town or if you want to consult or just have some ideas, I'm willing to do it. And um, if you can make a donation, I'm happy. If you can't, I'm okay. But the Creative Muse Hour, we started three years ago in Carl's Cozy Corner Cafe, which is his backyard in Winona. Uh, avenue in, in Hollywood and after three years we've brought out a lot of great talent like Joseph Ede, Diego Garcia from stage 11 uh, Craig the, Donovan Craig Donovan oh, thank you for bringing my mind up uh, Debbie Hennessy with PJ and uh, Carla uh, uh, Sandra McCott band who I hear from Al Collins are going on to do famous and good things and it starts with a dream and you can read your horoscope every day, but you have to live it. Actions speak louder than words. And if you tell somebody, I'm going to be there at 2 o'clock, by darn, try to be there by 2 o'clock. And if not, give them a call and come out, step out of your head. Uh, stop thinking so much. Don't be so critical of yourself. And with Creative Muse Hour, Colonel Daryl Harrelson uh, made me a little website, Creative Muse, M-U-S-E, hour.com. And I don't keep it up that much, but you can always reach me also, email, pitchasong at gmail.com. And one last thing, my phone is 602-300-9626. And Steve Levitt, I hope there's a part two to this and we really get into the spacey talk. Yeah, I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> we kind of were doing that in the car, getting, getting spacey, just hanging out. So, man, this was awesome. And I am so glad to share the space with you. And I'm glad you're doing this as uh, well as what you, you also do. Thank you. And hi to the family. All right. Namaste. Namaste. If you like our podcast, please check us out on the iTunes store or wherever you get your podcast and listen to our other episodes. Make sure you subscribe and look for new episodes in your inbox. Thanks for joining us.